All right, and God bless you, everyone. Um, we've got a very exciting evening tonight. If you look on the screen here today, we've got um, up there on the top, it says Elizabeth Spaces and Elizabeth Times. Does anyone know what the name Elizabeth means? Um, I'll give you one guess. Dedicated. Dedicated. Consecrated. Isn't that a wonderful name? I know. I do. Yep. So we're going to have a celebration. We're going to have we're going to have a celebration for our dedicated Elizabeth on her birthday. Is it today? Yes. It's today. Okay. Seventeen. And that I didn't know that until today, but that's the title of our Bible study, and that's the meaning of your name too. Did you know that was the meaning of your name? I did. Okay. Of course you did. So we've got a good group tonight, even young people coming. We just really appreciate that when young people are interested in... You know, I've, I've thought about these studies that we've had, and I do a lot of talking, and I'm trying to get to where I do less of that and more discussion, because I know we all have great thoughts and things to say. But sometimes with these contexts, it seems like we have to spend a lot of time building the context, right. and then there's not a lot of time left over for that. So we're, we're working on that. We're going to try and be better about that. Longer ones. <laughs> but we are we're studying. See, this is what I call, um, I put it this way. You can study the Bible in different ways. And you can study it with a microscope or with a telescope. Okay? So the microscope would be kind of like where Brother Branham on the campaigns would take two or three words, you know, like uh, there, they there, yeah, or um, from that time, and he'd just yeah. preach a whole sermon on that, or series, you know. And so that's the microscope, and he would mention things like John 3.16. Well, you could preach... A hundred sermons on John 3.16. But the telescope is a little different. That's You're taking a, a span, like a whole book of the Bible, and just doing a survey and, and getting all the history and the context. And that's kind of the way I focus, as you've probably noticed, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the telescope approach. So which is the right way? Both. both. Mm. Brother Branham did both, didn't he? In his home church, he was all that, you know, kind of more like a telescope. He did a lot of series. He did whole books of the Bible. And then when he's out on the campaign, he's like throwing out bait mm -hmm. to catch people's attention and just be a few little lines and preach on it out of inspiration. So it's kind of like a balanced diet. You need different things. So we're trying to fill in some of the, the telescope, the larger context approach and we've just been through you know a whole book of the bible here isn't that amazing mm -hmm. lord willing we'll finish nehemiah tonight Hallelujah. we'll see <laughs> see how it goes but we're going going to try and we've got a couple themes here which is already on the screen so um on the left we've got spaces these are some artist renditions of Solomon's temple. I don't know if it looked like that. Physical spaces. Dedicated. And we're also going to read about dedicated times. And Elizabeth, I know you know what dedicated means, don't you? Because you said it last week. Do you want to say it again? Okay. Okay. Consecrated to God. That space is for God only ah. and for nothing else. And not very shared with something on. else. Yes. Yeah. Set, aside. Set aside. That's very good. Wonderful. So I also brought some Bible reading schedules just for those who don't have one yet. So we can go ahead and pass these around. And... Um, If you don't have one, you know, when we made those, we made them just the size. It's the same size as a message book, and it'll fit right in your Bible. Now, are you required to go through the Bible reading schedule? 
No, you're not required to do anything. But it will do you good. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, sometimes people have started on this and, uh, and they say, oh, I'm way behind, and so they give up. But really, it's just a list of readings. The dates are there if you want to go through the Bible in a year. But I don't. I just, I'll miss a day here and there. And you just ignore the calendar and go to your next reading. Mm -hmm. And you just plug away at it. You'll get through the whole Bible. So that's going to help a lot of things. That's going to help our Bible studies. It'll help me not have to talk so much so you all can talk more. So, But it's not required because these are just tools to help us. So we're not putting a heavy on anyone that you have to do this, but I think it will help you and it would also help our Bible studies. You know, it's kind of like vegetables. Do you have to eat your vegetables to stay alive? Some say yes, (laughs) but really, (laughs) but really some people don't eat vegetables and they still stay alive, but they're not as healthy as they would be if they did eat their vegetables, right? So, I don't know if we had enough of those, but yeah, go ahead and slip it in your Bible and give it a try and don't get all bound up about it. Just You don't even have to read it an entire reading for a day. There's like three different parts of the Bible that'll take you to every reading, but you can just do one of them. You know, you could just do a Psalm or a history or a New Testament and just keep plugging away at it. And over time, it's going to pay off. So I just brought you some of those because I knew you really wanted them. Not one amen. Okay. (laughs) I courteously invite you to start going through the Bible reading. How's that? All right. So let's pray and we will get into our, our study here tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We just can't thank you enough. We just come to the Bible study tonight, gathered around your word. It's just so true. And we know there's, there's precious believers even out there on Zoom and maybe some others that will join in later on. And we just pray that your word here, as we study, will go forth with warmth and also with truth. And we commit the time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we'll get into the reading. We're going to be later on, a little bit, in a little while, we'll be in Nehemiah 13, verse 13, where we just left off. But uh, just a couple comments to set it up here so we can make sure and get our lessons. And we're going to try and make it relevant to our lives. So we don't just stand here on our end time high tower and look back at all these poor, ignorant people in the past and all the mistakes they made. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Right? But we can apply it to our lives too. So we're going to try and find some applications that are really direct for us also. Amen. Now, in the Old Testament, these um, two different concepts, the spaces and the times, were literal and they were physical. So you had a physical temple and God went into that temple by the Shekinah and that's where he was. So God is in there, right? And then you have a specific time that you worship. You had the specific holy days and you go at that time and worship. So that's all types. That has really uh, flipped in the New Covenant dispensation. Did I ever explain dispensation? Maybe I will. Uh, Because you hear that word, dispensationalism. I got a really good way to explain it. So do you ever go into wash your hands and there's a soap dispenser? Well, that word dispensation is in there. So when you push that button, you get a dispensation of soap. So what it is, it's just one little portion of something that God is doing at a particular season. 
That's what that big fancy word sounds. So we say the Old Testament dispensation. So at that time, he was doing that thing with those people. So that's one push. But he has other dispensations. So we're in the New Testament dispensation, which comes under a whole new program. So what happened to... This is a good one for discussion. What happened to the temple and what happened to the worship calendar once the new covenant hit? Where did that go? Hmm. Anyone know? Yes. So we become the temple. Okay. Yes, you're speaking very softly. I don't know if they can hear you, but yeah, the spiritual. So the Sabbath, I think you're, you're referring to where the Holy Ghost is Sabbath. The word Sabbath means rest, right? That's what it means. So the Holy Ghost becomes your rest. So it's not you going into the Sabbath, the Sabbath going into you. Okay. So all these holy days and this holy place of worship, which was the temple, now it was drilled into those Jews to the point of almost fear and trembling that this is a sacred, holy place. And if you make one little misstep in there, you could just die on the spot. That's why they tied a rope around the ankle of the high priest and they hang, hung bells from the bottom fringes of his robe. So if ever they, the bell stopped ringing, they knew that he must have offended God, and they could pull him out by the ankle by the rope. So that was their concept of the holiness of God. So if you think about that a little bit, all that holiness is in you? Well... Is it possible that it is now magnified from what it was? Because you could be, you know, holy when you come to worship, but then you kind of create some distance when you go back to your farm or your job or whatever. But if you're carrying that temple around everywhere, everything about the holiness of that God is going with you. And that is kind of almost the opposite of what sometimes modern New Testament Christians get so loosey-goosey <laughs> about their expression of the faith when, when it's actually the opposite. That all that great holy God on, on the mountain, and praise God there's grace or none of us would survive. Mm -hmm. He has grace for it. But he wants us to understand that all that holiness is now in you. So that puts a whole new tone on how you should live and how careful you should be Praise with God. that yes. holy. It's not just a title. Holy Ghost, that's an adjective. Holy Spirit. That's what he is. That's describing what he is. And he can be um, grieved. So all the holiness doesn't disappear. Everything isn't just common now. It's now right in you. It's magnified, expanded, and it goes with you wherever you go. And it's an extremely high calling. And uh, if we understand this, we'll be more serious about holiness. So our lesson tonight kind of goes down that thread. Um, Looking back at Nehemiah's time, they had some challenges in this area, in the physical thing. But we're going to apply it more to our situation. The Lord has high goals for us, and He has high goals for what He wants us to be. And in order for us to attain that, it's going to require a high level of dedication. Okay, so the higher your goal is, like if you want to be an Olympic athlete, that takes more dedication than to be on the neighborhood softball team. 
You can just show up to that. But if you want to be an Olympic athlete, so this is spiritual Olympics is what it is. You're going for the gold medal, the highest calling there has ever been mm -hmm. for human beings. Mm -hmm. And they, everything else in that person's life takes a back seat to this priority mm -hmm. that I am up at five in the morning, I'm training every day, I've got a special diet. They have that kind of dedication. Well, it's because their aspiration is so high. Mm -hmm. So if our aspiration is really to be the bride of Christ, that's going to take a high level of dedication. Otherwise, we're just kidding ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're uh, called to. And uh, to take that up as a calling and realize it is worth it. Amen. It is worth it. Amen. It's, it's a prize that is beyond uh, anything that um, mm -hmm. the world could ever offer you. Amen. So we're going to talk just briefly about um, times. I know we mentioned this a couple times, but I didn't have a scripture for it. So I put the scripture on here. My slide will go. Trying everything. Excuse me a moment while the computer doesn't cooperate. Let's try this. I'm trying to get it to advance. I'm trying to get it to advance, yep. You tried your arrow. There you go. That isn't the one I wanted, but that's, that's a good one. Okay, here's some. Um, just for times, and underneath the uh, ever-present menu that gets in our way up there, it says uh, that this is a precept. So it's, it's not a law, but it's a precept that's in the Bible. And this is something we can see all through the Bible if you're watching for it, that there's certain times during the day that the Lord would like to have that space in your heart. And a couple of them is morning and night. The Lord would like to have a space with you in those times. Mm -hmm. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up my glory. Awake by psaltery and harp. And I myself will awake early, and right after I check my texts, and update my status, and check my email, and see what all the people I am following have posted, after all that, I will praise thee, O Lord. I kind of added a little bit in there. You might have noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. I will praise thee, O Lord. So it's almost like your, your spirit is a blank slate in the morning, and the Lord wants to be the first thing on there. It becomes fundamental for you, and it creates a, a foundation for your day. So this is just by way of example, but I just typed in early. If you ever want to do a Bible search, and <coughs> type in the word early, you'll get a flood of verses that are kind of like this. It's amazing how often the Lord uh, comes back to this. Even the Lord Jesus early in the morning would be up praying by himself while his disciples are all still sleeping probably. So he's modeling it out for us too. O oh Lord, among the people I will sing unto thee among the nations. And then this other one, the cool of the day. So this was a habit. The Lord comes at the end of the day before you go to bed at night. And I, they hear the voice of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife uh, were on their devices and, <laughs> I mean, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord <laughs> amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? So I wonder if he ever asks me that. So I can put my name in there. Mark, where are you? Just a minute, I, I'm just fin I'm finishing up something here. Yeah. You're right there. Yes. So it's a, it, another place where the Lord would like to have a dedicated time. So 
You know, these are interesting things because you could never prove them from the scripture absolutely that this is a rule or anything like that. But if you have the right attitude, you can just see it, you know. It's just like vegetables. They're good for you. The Lord wants that time with you. So. And Brother Mark? Yes. I think, too, we can even get legalistic with ourselves that, you know, the very first thing of the day mm-hmm. needs to be my time with the Lord. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to build a fire on the wood stove or make myself a cup of coffee yep. or use the restroom. I'm actually just going to go straight to my Bible. It's not like that because, not like because that. that's law. Exactly. And sometimes there's things you have to take care of. Right. Of, of course. So early, mm-hmm. but yeah, putting him before, like you're saying, all the you know, checking my texts. Uh, all the unnecessary email. things, yeah. yeah. Because mm-hmm. if you check your email, surely something will be in there that will distract yes. you while you're trying to read the Bible. Oh. Or, you know, that's such a good point, Sister Shannon, because it's really it's hard to communicate these things without making them sound like they're law. And then that's the wrong idea. But then if you dismiss it all together, then that's the wrong idea too. It's in between those two things. It's an aspiration. It's a goal. It's something you're shooting for, but it's not a law. You mean it would take discernment to understand this? Well, yes, <laughs> precepts. We've been working on precepts. That's why I put precept up there. What's so. A precept. Mm. Were you here for the precept Bible studies? Oh, okay. All right, I'll let someone else. Who who was here for that that can give a good answer to? Because we did some work on that. The idea and the examples, but I couldn't really define the word. Yeah. Well, a precept is a Bible word. A general principle. Spirit of the law, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Like there was the one about if if grain falls and the, the ox tries to eat it, don't don't don't, don't it. muzzle yeah. the ox. Don't yeah. muzzle the ox. Yeah. Let it mm-hmm. so people will be like, I will never muzzle my ox. But then they're missing the point of what that is saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's what Paul came along and explained. They'll be like, well, I don't have an ox, so I don't have to obey that one. Right. <laughs> yeah. but there's a lesson in there. But there's, a, there's a, another meaning to it. Yep. They skip mm-hmm. over and just follow it right to the matter. And Brother John's been talking about the heart of the matter in his preaching. Yes. And sometimes the precept is the heart that's underneath the commandment because there, you can't have a commandment for every situation, especially in a world where technology is coming in and things are here that have never been here before that the Bible doesn't call out. But there's principles in there that we can apply to any situation. So we call that a precept. And it's also a Bible word. So if you do a Bible search and type in the word precept, you'll find it all through there. So, and that's really interesting to see how it uses the word too. So, good question. Thank you. Brother Kyle preached probably nine years ago on a Sunday night. A good example that I've never heard before on that particular scripture. Mm. And he was saying it's like um, the first thing when you eat your meal is going to kind of fill you up a little bit. Hmm. You start off eating a bunch of sugar and the yummy stuff and the fun mm. things. You may not have room for the salad and the vegetables right. and the meat. Mm. You yeah. So you can only take so much of your right. attention in the mornings and really... Focus, mm-hmm. and if you start doing those other fun things, have a 30 minute conversation with your friend on the phone, and then say, Well, now I'll do devotions. But you've already filled up your appetite for mm-hmm. information and your spirit for something mm-hmm. that you're not going to have the capacity you would. Yeah. That was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great example. What is it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Many years ago, Brother Jeremiah, I don't know if you remember Brother Jeremiah from Africa, mm-hmm. he spoke one of the convention meetings. I can't remember the title, but it was all about getting up early. I remember that, yeah. Yes. That was the quietest service I remember in a long time. <laughs> there was no amens. It was like a pin drop service. Yeah, it was. Good night shifts. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think there was some. <laughs> he did. I do remember that, sister. Yeah. 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 And his point, I think, was not just that the Lord is the first thing, but that it should also be early. 
taking a note. So. You had a quote about the demons going to sleep around 3 o'clock in the morning. The nice yep. thing about the appetite thing too, that example, one thing I've thought about is like uh, if you if you start to fill fill yourself up on things that are not <laughs> the word first, mm -hmm. and then you know you're you've lost appetite and it's like filling up on junk food. But when you start with the word after that, when you go through your day, because you have to go to work, you have to talk to people. You have, for me, I tend to have like much more of a clear mind. I have way better judgment, just on a total natural level. Mm -hmm. My driving is always safer <laughs> if I start off the day. I'm, I'll just be driving to work and I'm like, wow, I'm taking every turn, you know. I, I, just without thinking, like, like my mind stops. Everything is like... I stopped at that stop sign. Everything. <laughs> See, it's not like, okay, I've, I'm full on... I, I did my devotions and I'm full on that, so I can't function doing anything else. Like right. I'm full filled up on the word. No, it helps everything else. Yeah, yeah. makes it, you... Like, kind of sets everything else in order. It's a great testimony. You know, we can prove the word through scriptures and texts, but another great way to prove it is through testimonies like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've I had think... that experience of having awakened at 4 a.m. by a phone call from somebody, and then two hours later, because it was a serious thing, they had to run to work, and it with much time in the word, other maybe listen to a little bit on the car and away, and your whole day just doesn't go right. Mm -hmm. right. It just does not go right. Mm -hmm. Your spirit, your attitude, everything. Yeah. To be honest, that's how it is, I think. Yep. I think so. I, have, I tend to have a better day. Like, I always have a better day when I've done devotions that morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a happier mm -hmm. person, and I have more patience in things. Patience is a good one. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, it's somehow we just, we know this intuitively, and then we know it through experience, and we see it in the Word. So, that's three uh, good confirmations right there. So, that's not what our study is about, but it kind of is in the way of a dedicated time. So, because we're talking about a time, a dedicated time. So, if you give the Lord, we place you in the highest place. Well, the first place. That's a very you know, key honoring position to give the Lord the, the first input into your spirit when you wake up. That's honoring to the Lord, and He will bless you for it. So, moving right along. Oh, let's go back to this one. Of course, you remember this character here. May I share your dedicated space, Christian Share, right? He doesn't really want to share. See, that's just the skinny end of the wedge. Because behind the skinny of the wedge is the fat end of the wedge. So the skinny end of the wedge gets in, and he and Tobiah ends up not just sharing, but crowding everything else out. Mm -hmm. That's his overall goal. He just wants in there a little bit. And so for us, oftentimes, our big challenge is this lovely little device that is a window to the whole world 24-7, 365 and always begging for our attention. So I'm probably going to keep mentioning that. I know you might get tired of it, but I'm also studying up for a youth camp on it, so it's going to be on my heart a little bit. So I might this example is going <laughs> to keep popping up in the Bible studies, but it won't hurt us because we're all going to take our devices when we go home, and we're all going to deal with them tomorrow. So <clears throat> share or dedicated, which is it? Can't be both. And uh, I just, by way of remembering persuasion through mobile devices, remember this from Stanford University, some of you are here for that. So they have a, a, a deliberate effort um, taking these principles to learn <coughs> how to control people through devices. So it's totally up in the, out in the open. They are doing this. And they're doing it for profit, and they don't care if it's good for you. But there, there's lots of study and lots of research behind it. So there's a, an, an element to this that I just really want to get across. Remember B.J. Fogg? Don't be lost in the fog. B.J. Fogg was the one who kind of pioneered this, this whole um, 
new field of study that never existed before because smartphones didn't exist before. But at the collegiate level, oh, we can influence people through these things and how. So it became a whole program at Stanford. And they go through that program and they graduate and they come out and they know how to do it. And Mr. Fogg had all these wonderful ideas of how we can get people to live better lives and be more healthy and do wonderful things by influencing in the right way. But you can take all those same principles and influence people the wrong way, which is a lot more profitable. So that's what ends up happening. And that's where a lot of the platforms that come on our devices are based on. So what are they trying to do? Um, I just want to communicate. I'm going to try once again to communicate um, something that is kind of hard. Because we have our defenses up. And especially as Christians, we have our defenses up. We understand we're under attack. And so we understand the direction that attack is coming from and we put our defenses in that place. And so we are going to decide, so this is the way we think about things, how we're going to be influenced and what influences we are going to let in and how are you going to repel the ones we don't want. Well, Christians do that in a certain way, but everybody does that in another way, Christian or not. So they've got what I call two brains. We all have two brains. Actually, physically, we have two brains. They're a different shape, they have a different structure, and they have a different purpose. And they do different things. So I'm just going to show you that when they plan this, they're aiming at only one of your brains. There's the executive brain. Okay. That is the one that's the frontal cortex. It's where your, your inter, inner um, monologue is going when you hear yourself talking to yourself. And that is what is called the executive brain. And that's the decision-making brain. And that is what we are putting out to repel all the things, the influences we don't want to have. So the platform designers know this and they are not they are totally ignoring your executive brain. They don't care. They are targeting. Uh, <laughs> this is, I'm actually using their terminology here. I didn't make Why? this up. Reptile. Your reptile, reptile brain. Interesting. Has anyone ever been in the situation and go, how many of these potato chips have I had? Mm. Anyone ever been like that? Yes. Did, <laughs> did your executive brain get involved and go, I think I'm going to eat this whole bag now. That's not how it works. You're distracted thinking about something else while your executive brain is doing something else. Your reptile brain is binging on chips. So that's just an obvious example. My executive brain has decided I'm going to watch this because I have determined that it is good and sanctified and good for me and I will watch it. <laughs> but the reptile brain is going, give me that popcorn. Feed me. And my reptile brain is going to eat this whole bowl and my executive brain won't even notice. Ha! So that's what's going on, see? And the platform designers are aiming at a reflex, not a decision. They're aiming at, they're targeting, they want to get a reflex. And you might not even know you did it. So when you're in that situation, oh, how many of us have ever done this? I am going to put these chips in the other room because if they are there within reach what's going to happen you are going to eat them yep. <laughs> so that is just a a physical now you think we're off nehemiah because when we get into this 
what Nehemiah did was he put physical uh, restraints in place to make sure that the wrong things didn't happen. Didn't just depend upon the willpower and the dedication and the repentance and the zeal of the people to do the right thing. He actually, when the problems came up, he took physical measures. That's really uh, one of the key ways that you ever defeat temptation and sin. Lead us not into temptation. Hmm. Okay. Why didn't Jesus pray, Oh Lord, let us stand in front of temptation and be strong. That wasn't the prayer. The prayer was to not lead us into the presence of the temptation. So the battle is won on a different level. Once the temptation is there, boy, you've, you've already half lost. <laughs> Your reptile brain is not smart about that. It just reacts. It's just like a fish when it sees that bait. You know, the fish isn't thinking, you know, when I get up there, I'm going to suddenly swerve hard to the left and bite a worm. It's just a reflex. Something in that fish says, ah, food. And he gets the hook. See? So we all have that part of us that does that. And that's the part that we have to protect. And we have to have measures in place because that part of your brain is not smart about it. It just reacts. That's all it does. So you need to help it. You need to help that part of your brain doing physical things. I'm going to mention your example in a moment, Ben, but that was a really good one that we talked about today. So the Israeli Air Force, so another example of this, 1967 war. The Israeli Air Force, how did they win that war? Those who have studied the war... Before the war even started, they flew under the radar and killed all and wiped out all the enemy planes before they got off the runway. And then the war is a lot easier to win, right? Because then the enemy has no air power. Preemptive. Nehemiah was doing these kinds of things. Preemptive strikes. He could see where the attacks were coming from. And he doesn't just try to get the people motivated under zeal. He puts measures in place. So, Brother Mark, all you need is the Holy Ghost. If you've got the Holy Ghost, He will help you to overcome all temptations. Well, news flash. What if the Holy Ghost is teaching you how to reduce the temptations and not be faced with them. What if that is how the Holy Ghost is helping you? Hmm? You do need the Holy Ghost, but if you have the Holy Ghost, you're going to absorb these lessons from the Word and make uh, um, put safety measures, yeah, put up fences and help yourself not to get into that place because the Holy Ghost is going to be like the Israeli Air Force that's not going to let these things get off the ground to begin with. So, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Holy Ghost would blow the TV out. I think he said blow it out with a shotgun. Blow it out with a shotgun, yes. <laughs> Hmm. And now we've all got a TV in our pocket. So we uh, need to have some strategies. If we're going to have that thing in our pocket, we've got to have not just commitment. We need some actual physical strategies to keep that thing under control. And I'm working on some for the, the camp that's coming up. Last time I did that camp, I just I explained all the dangers, but I realized that's not enough. Young people and old people need some actual physical strategies to be able to keep that device under control. So that's what I'm working on. I asked Brother Karim to help me a little bit, and uh, I talked about it with Brother Brandon, who was here last week. He's pretty technical. 
and we're going to try and you know if there if the temptation is coming through a technical way we're going to fight fire with fire and try to put some actual technical restrictions on that phone that you can very voluntarily put on there to help your own dumb reptile brain not get swept away so all right uh nehemiah 13 i think that's all i got for slides we'll go through this we're doing good for time and lord willing we'll get through nehemiah tonight and then we'll have a wonderful time talking about what to do next mm -hmm. in our bible study so <clears throat> i'll start with verse 13 and then we'll just go around here and if anyone doesn't want to read just say i pass and then, then we'll just jump over you and we'll go to the next person. It's not required that you have to read. So verse 13, and I made treasurers over the treasuries. Why is he doing all this? Because he didn't have treasuries, treasures over the treasuries before and all the treasuries got wasted. So he's always starting out right now. Um, no, I don't think we need to. I think, yeah, it'll start making sense here. And Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe. So this is Tobiah that had moved in and, you know, the treasuries and then the tithes weren't being taken because there was no place to take them. And so, and there was nobody watching the situation and Nehemiah was gone. And so now he's putting people in place to keep an eye on this so it doesn't happen again. So he's, he's, this is one first example of that. And Zadok, the scribe of the Levites, and Padiah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, and they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. So the tithes are going to the priests and Levites so that they can get worship going again. And why don't you read verse 14, Brother Ben. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. Oh, so this is a good thing. Nehemiah believes that he's done this. I think so too. All right, next problem. What pops up? Verse 15, Sister Renee. In those days saw I Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine, grapes, and figs and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victual victuals. Okay. Yes, you jumped right ahead of me on that one. This is a dedicated day, and they're doing regular work. So that is in the type the physical things but we are looking at our spirits with this also letting things into our spirits that we should be dealing with on the sabbath okay uh, verse 16 there dwelt man of tyre also therein which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the sabbath unto the children of judah and in jerusalem okay so tyre is a city to the north it's a type of the United States of America. We'll get into that someday. It was a great commercial center. They had entertainment. They had music. They had drama. They had videos. They had products. They had international trade. And the stuff that you could get from the city of Tyre, you couldn't get anywhere else. So now they're exporting right down to Jerusalem. And some of this stuff was downright irresistible. Wow. Those fish they have in Tyre, those recipes they have, we don't have those down here. Problem is, they show up on the Sabbath. And the temptation is great. And they're selling. Well, how are they selling? Because people are buying. Mm -hmm. And why are they buying? Because they're tempted. Mm -hmm. Hmm, how are we going to deal with this? <laughs> Thank you, Sister Deborah. <laughs> and I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that we do and profane the Sabbath day? That's wrong. Yes. Verse 18. Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God 
bring all this evil upon us and upon the city, yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by proclaiming the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So let's go back and look at history. This has all been tried before and it didn't turn out well. So he's reminding them of history. That's why they lost everything. Yep. Was things like this that don't really even seem that bad. I mean, they aren't worshiping idols. They're not doing gross, you know, immoral sins. They're just buying a few fish on the Sabbath. What's so wrong with that? Hmm. But that's how it starts. Okay, and Nehemiah's response. Sister Charity, how does he handle this? And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said, I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. Hmm. <laughs> he's going to make sure. Hmm. Mm. So you think that's, think that's going to work, what he's doing there? Well, let's talk about it. He's doubling up. He's posting guards and he's shutting the gate. Wow. So in our types, remember that the city without walls is like the unsaved person, right? And the city without gates and without walls is like the unsaved person. So now in our types, we're not dealing with the unsaved person. We're dealing with the saved person, us, that have gates and have walls. Yes. But there still can be a problem. There still can be a problem because a gate can be open or shut because so let's take just the natural, our eye gates. You can't just walk around with your eyes closed all the time now that you have the Holy Ghost, right? <laughs> you don't have your ears shut all the time. You've got to let some things in and other things out. So now that you've got the gates, you have to be using those gates and know when to close them and when to open them. And if the wrong things are coming in, you got to shut the gates. So this, yeah. this applies to the, the Holy Ghost field, filled Christian, not just the unsaved person. You still have something you have to do.